there were a lot of parallels to be sort of drawn between what happened during those two years and two months and what was what's been happening in our country now there was a fight over whether the president would allow himself to be interviewed you know stuff like that there was just a lot of little moments that that people could could listen could listen to the show and, and notice and say oh wait that's that's pretty similar to what's been happening now It's kind of a bizarro world where Watergate never happens, where people like John Dean, who now are on the TV regularly talking about how bad things were in the Nixon administration, refuse to testify and get no repercussions for it. Where John Mitchell, who would be forced to resign the Nixon administration, isn't even bothered enough to show up at Congress, and where nobody outside one newspaper really cares all that much where liberal Democrats vote along with Southern conservatives and Republicans to protect Richard Nixon's reputation. It's a bizarro world, but really, it's the way Watergate was in 1972 versus 1973. Something that we've talked about a lot on this cast, but I think artfully described in a detailed series of podcast episodes by Leon Nafok, who is the host of the Slow Burn podcast, who's going to join us today. And I was always told as a kid that when we used to hunt coons and and uh, rabbits and go up fox hunting now and then. We never did feed our dogs before we started hunting. And that's the way the banks are. They're all fed up with government bonds and guaranteed paper, and they, they're more or less indifferent toward the little man. In 1928, Wright Patman was elected. It soon became clear that this was not going to be an ordinary, quiet little House member. He's elected as the Great Depression starts ravaging the country, and in 1932, it's Patman who introduces a bill to impeach Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon. Mellon was the most powerful person in the country, it seemed, at times, during the 1920s. He's forced to resign within a month. But it's not the events of the 1930s that we'd like to talk about today. It is the events that occurred 40 years later. Because Wright Patman, now an aging Texas House member, sees some irregularities with what's going on with the break-in in the Watergate case, the break-in at the Watergate Hotel. Patman is the head of the Banking and Currency Committee. And so in his jurisdiction, may not be the whole burglary, may not be looking into a cover-up or, or what was going on. But he wants to investigate why these very clean $100 bills were found on the Watergate burglar's person upon their re arrest. He thinks they can link them directly to Creep, the committee to re-elect the president. And in 1972, Patman's committee begins hearings. Now, this is important because this is a full year. This is two years before Nixon would resign. And this is a full year before the Watergate case really came to prominence. It's known. But what's happening in 1972 is it's get, getting talked about merely as a Washington scandal that the rest of the country doesn't care about. Yes, these burglars were found doing some dirty tricks in the Democratic National Committee's office. We talked with Leon Nafok, who is the host of the Slow Burn podcast. One of the things that he did a great job in with season one that I think people that like this cast, and we've talked about Watergate a lot, will love, is that he uncovered some of the smaller stories around Watergate in great detail. For instance, he has an episode on Martha Mitchell, and there's another one on 
Congressman Wright Patman. And what happened to his committee's investigation? He goes into much greater detail than we can hear. Really great to have you on. Thanks for coming on. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Thank you, Bruce. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Your podcast I found fascinating, and, I, and it was one of those that I, I record a podcast. I also binge on podcasts from time to time, so I found myself, like so many Americans, binging on the Slow Burn podcast that you produce. I like to start with uh, the story of Wright Potman, okay. congressman from Texas. Could you talk a bit about who he was and what he tried to do so early on? Wright Patman uh, was a congressman from Texas. He was a, a, a sort of um, economic populist who um, chaired the uh, House Banking Committee. And when he heard about the break-in at the Watergate and learned that burglars who were involved in the, in the break-in had money, you know, and, and specifically uh, consecutive bills, he got very curious about where this money had come from and um who had given it to them. And so he uh, basically deputized a couple of his staffers to try to um, find out uh, what was going on. And so um, for for quite a while, he, he was he was trying to uh, kind of establish the uh, you know chain of custody for this money, uh, which, of course, uh, took him to uh, to the to the uh, campaign to reelect the president, uh, Richard Nixon. And so uh, what happened was that uh, Patman wanted subpoena power uh, for the for his House Banking Committee so they could launch a proper investigation, uh, and this is this is in like the months following the burglary. So right, mm-hmm. so before before the seventy two election, uh, when no one you know cared about Watergate, no one was really uh, appreciating uh, how important it w- it, would, it would turn out to be or how serious it was. Um, Patman was you know just one of a few voices sort of trying to make hay about it, and he he. Um, ultimately was unable to get subpoena power because um, his fellow members of the House Banking Committee did not uh, did not want to uh, vote for it. And so, you know, there's 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 some questions about why uh, some of his, especially some of his fellow Democrats uh, didn't vote for it. And Wright would lose his own committee's vote. It's rare to vote against the chairman. It happens sometimes. He's got some Southerners that are basically supporting Nixon, so even though they're Democrats, so that was expected. But two Democrats in particular, who were liberals, vote for the motion. One of them is Frank Brasco. And Brasco comes from a Brooklyn district that really should be supporting, um, that's that's anti-Nixon. It's revealed later, Brasco had been the target of an investigation of alleged fraud and bribery activities since 1970. John Mitchell used his personal connections in New York to pressure Brasco's defection. He arranged a meeting with Brasco and a New York City Democratic leader. The topic was Brasco's role in the House Banking Currency Committee proceedings. Historians have speculated about uh, what might have persuaded them. Uh, There's theories that, you know, Nixon's people kind of leaned on so there i think there are pretty persuasive uh pretty persuasive uh theories that there was there was pressure exerted on them you know related to their uh you know to their own campaign financing and 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 basically the implication was that threats were made to them that you know if they if they didn't vote the right way on this they would they would regret it regret it but it's a very different watergate that it that emerges in 1972 as opposed to 1973. For instance, this Patman committee is unable to question four Nixon aides, John Mitchell, Clark McGregor, uh, who had both been chairmen of the committee to reelect the president, Maurice Stans, president's chief fundraiser, and John Wesley Dean, John Dean, uh, who did a in-house investigation of the Watergate ins- of the Watergate within the White House before he flipped and testified before Congress. So in the end, he lost, Patman lost the vote, and uh, basically his investigation ended uh, with that. Um, it's, you know, it's sort of interesting to think, like, what would have happened if he had been able to get subpoena power, get get people, you know, to compel people to, to, to appear before him? There's a very sort of amazing photograph of Patman 
holding a, a hearing where a bunch of the Nixon people were supposed to show up and testify, but they didn't because they didn't have to. Um, they'd been invited, but they hadn't been subpoenaed. So um, Patman's investigation kind of sputtered, and um, that was that. Just a very different Watergate in 1972 than what is going to happen in the next year when the story explodes and there's a lot more TV coverage of it. This Patman Committee, it's a story that I think I'll refer you to Leon's excellent Slow Burn podcast. One of the things that happens here during this time is George McGovern's asking Ted Kennedy, who's the chairman of a committee that has oversight over such matters uh, to please investigate. And he's, at least according to the New York Times, he's reluctant. So it's a different uh, planet that almost everyone is on just the year before. Leon gets into that. In Leon's second season, he deals with Whitewater and the Clinton impeachment and starts telling that story. And we're going to speak to him about that. Correspondents Association and some other White House staff members to discuss how we could hold down the cost of future trips. Not many people paid attention to the White House Travel Office. It technically existed since the time of Andrew Jackson. By the time the Clintons come to office, it's a seven million dollar operation with with uh, several employees, and it was led up by a person named uh, Billy Dale. He was hired during the Reagan administration in 1982. And as one employee said, ran it like an old country store. Billy Dale began taking the refunds that he might get from an airline for canceled trips, which were intended to go to the media companies. He would later acknowledge the exercise poor judgment as he put 55 refund checks totaling 54000 through his own bank account. But he insisted he was using that money to defray cost of future trips. During the Bush administration, news executives had said, and this is as travel costs generally are going up, said, you've got to cut the cost of travel, it's too expensive. He would use these funds to lower the cost of certain trips. The 55 checks were refunds that the travel office received primarily from telephone and bus companies that overbilled for services provided on prior presidential trips. The Clintons come to office in 1993, and there's a couple of factors. It's pretty clear that a distant cousin of Bill Clinton, Catherine Cornelius, who managed all of the travel out of Arkansas during the Clinton campaign, you know, wants to do this for the White House. And... The Clintons are a good friend with uh, Harry Thomason, kind of a TV movie producer in, in L.A., um, who are a big factor in the Clinton White House. And he's got a, an involvement with an airline that he'd like to see used for these trips, just as had been used uh, during the Clinton campaign. There's a White House aide, David Watkins, who kind of has control of this area of the White House. This is not something that Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton are managing personally. But David Watkins, the campaign staffer who's running these administrative areas of the, of the White House, attends the meetings and Catherine Cornelius presents that they can save, you know, 200000 if they outsource this travel business. They find out that Billy Dale's not doing a competitive bidding. So right there, there's probably going to be some savings that could be had. They find some irregularities now. This is where lawyer William Kennedy and Vince Foster, who will become infamous for his suicide later in the year, are called in. Early 1993, Bill Clinton, it seemed, could not get a break. He was elected with a small percentage of the vote, 43%. Many people voted for Bush or Perot, not for him. He was coming to Washington, entering an establishment, having been from Arkansas, it was so bad in 93 that one of the things that's going to trip him up has nothing to do with real politics at all. 
it's getting a haircut. President had just appeared at a basketball court and reminded the news media about the enterprise program to help inner city youth. None of that would get much media attention. I hadn't found a barber in Washington yet. I couldn't go back to Arkansas for three weeks. And my hair was too long. Hillary had her hair done by a man in Los Angeles, Christophe, who was a friend of the Thomasons and whom I like very much. I asked Christophe if he would be willing to give me a quick trim. He agreed to do it and met me in my private quarters on Air Force One. Before we started, I asked the Secret Service not once, but twice, to make sure I wouldn't cause any delay in takeoffs or landings. They checked with the airport personnel who said it would be no problem. Then I asked Christophe to just make me presentable. He did, 10 minutes or so, and we took off. The next thing I knew, there was a story out that I had kept two runways tied up for an hour, inconveniencing thousands of people. Well, I got a $200 haircut from a fancy hairdresser who was known only by his first name. Forget the basketball game with inner city kids. The irresistible news was that I had shed my Arkansas roots for an expensive indulgence. It was a good story, but it wasn't true. George Stephanopoulos reports, I was getting questions from the press such as, did the president pay for his pricey haircuts? Finances were Hillary's department, and her staff said I was supposed to tell reporters the Clintons had a personal services contract with Christophe. Oh, that'll help, I thought. Naturally, they wanted to see the contract, which nobody would give me because it probably didn't exist. The travel office scandal that became a big news event um, gets added to this series of investigations that we kind of blanket as whitewater. And I find it quite an interesting way because it's such a small matter, given the gravity of events, you know, today. It's, it, as it turned out, as I learned when, when I was doing my research, you can't really explain how we got to impeachment uh, without um, kind of following the threads back all the way to, you know, 1992 and even earlier to Arkansas, because in order for this perfect storm to, to gather, you needed the Whitewater controversy in which the Clintons were accused of various misconduct involving a, a land deal um, that they'd gone in on with some friends in, in Little Rock. They ended up losing money on the land deal, but there were a sort of ancillary uh, transactions and, and, and decisions made that uh, attracted scrutiny. I find that fascinating. I mean, of course, the first thing that, that, that strikes me with Whitewater and my memory of it is that you have a president right now and supporters who are claiming no president has ever been savaged from the get go as much as me. And my gosh, I mean, the early, are we forgetting the early Clinton years from month one? The focus of the presidency was not, you know, what is he going to do? It's what did he, what did he and his wife do back in Arkansas? And I, while I think, you know, certain members of the media certainly favor Democrats and, and, and are liberal and that sort of thing, someone going back in a time machine to 1993, I mean, the, the media were out to get them. The, the press, uh, it, I, I haven't seen that angry a press room, and, and, uh, you know, until uh, 2017, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you know, people were very energetic about um, sort of digging into the Clinton's past. Um, so I think it's I think it's absolutely true that uh, that the, the journalists were very sort of energetically invested in uh, digging into the Clinton's past. I think the Clintons deserve some of the blame because they really kind of acted in a way that made people think they had something to hide, even though mm -hmm. I think in a lot of these cases they didn't. They just like were 
private. They were secretive. They um, they just made decisions that made them look shady. And um, understandably, journalists wanted to um, you know figure out what was going on. And a great loss to the White House and to the country. Talk with them a little bit. The travel off of scandal is one of the many things that uh, is tied with the suicide of Vince Foster. He kills himself in a park in McLean, Virginia. Work can never be the only thing in life. I also um, of course, conspiracy theorists suggest that the Clintons had been involved because of what he might have known, you know. Two separate Whitewater independent councils and congressional panels conducted separate investigations, concluded again and again that Foster took his own life. It comes up again in a congressional investigation, this travel office matter, in 1996. Because there's now a memorandum that surfaces from David Watkin, who's since been fired because he did his own improprieties in uh, taking a helicopter from the White House to uh, a golf game. In previous administrations at this hearing, and I will assure the gentleman... That and William F. Klinger, Pennsylvania Republican, heads up the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee. This is after the 94 elections. You now have an investigation of the president, and they focus on this memo where Watkins says that he had spoken directly with Hillary Clinton about the matter five days before the travel office dismissals. The worst is this memorandum that is intended for the White House Chief of Staff, Mac McClarty. Watkins writes, We both know that there would be hell to pay if we failed to take swift and decisive action in conformity with the First Lady's wishes. And so you have this scene, and there's congressional investigations, you have Republicans who want to continue the investigations. This wrongdoing may include the abuse of the FBI and IRS to advance the fortunes of friends and family at the expense of innocent bystanders, an area this committee will explore in subsequent hearings. And so you have this scene, and there's congressional investigations. You have Our office, so highly thought of and trusted by the people for whom we work and with whom we did business for so many years, could be perceived by the Clinton White House as being so rotten Republicans who want to continue the investigations and Democrats who are attacking the investigation itself. That the committee's investigation has been conducted by a person who was connected in any way to the fiscal mismanagement and poor accounting practices at the uh, travel office. Such a conflict of interest. The idea that the person working for our committee at one time had been the supervisor of the office of the travel at the White House when he worked for the White House and then came over here and investigated the White House travel office. Such a conflict of interest. I'm sure at some point during Whitewater many times the word witch hunt was used, but I'm not sure if in this this particular hearing there was. Leon Nafok's next season of Slow Burn is all about Whitewater. And so I thought it would be interesting to talk to him about that and, uh, Let's get his take, and I'm really looking forward to delving in. I think there was a sort of mystery around Whitewater, like in part because no one understood what the hell the accusations were even about. It was such a such a such a hard to grasp scandal. It was so abstract that um, it kind of people I think could project a lot onto it. for the simple reason they didn't really understand it, um, we kind of do our best to try to give the cliff notes on it in, uh, in episode two. But 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 um, the, the Clinton impeachment, and you can't explain how it came about without going back and explaining Whitewater, which led to the appointment of, an, of, a, of a special prosecutor, which led to Ken Starr. Um, and you can't explain it without uh, telling the story of Paula Jones, who was a woman who worked for the Arkansas state government um, and who. Uh, accused Clinton of sexually harassing her uh, in a lawsuit that she filed in 1994. Paula Jones' lawsuit resulted in Monica Lewinsky being subpoenaed to testify about her relationship with Clinton because Paula Jones' lawyers very uh, astutely thought that if they could show that Clinton had a pattern of behavior in which he made sexual overtures to subordinates, people who worked for him, that bolstered their client's claim. You had this. You had these two sort of trains running on parallel tracks, and they collided with the relationship between Clinton and Lewinsky. The show does try to sort of tell the whole story and kind of figure, show how the pieces go together. 
look, there were multiple, as you know, and multiple investigations in, in Watergate. There was the Senate investigation. Um, then there was an FBI investigation, not unlike That's the right. uh, Russia investigation now, where you have this kind of dual track. There were FBI investigations related to Whitewater. Uh, on his podcast, uh, Best Case, Worst Case, the, Jim Clemente, who's involved with CSI, a writer, and a lot of other crime podcasts, he talks about, because he was an FBI agent, Responsible for investigating Watergate, uh, White Water, I should say. It's funny, right? It's it's funny how to, how, how easy it is to 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 accidentally say one and not the other, isn't it? I actually one of my little pet theories yeah. that I can't prove is that one of the reasons White Water has such sta- staying power is that it sounded a little bit like Watergate, so people mm-hmm. kind of just like imbued it with the with the sexiness of Watergate, uh, either you know, subconsciously. Yeah, I very much think that in 1993 that was going on. You have to remember too; it, it's before internet. And uh, at least the beginning of it. So it's this new president comes in. You're just hearing things on TV. It's just water, white, white water, white water. No one can look up what white water, where it is. It's, I always wrote white water off, and I still do to an extent. Uh, I'd like to hear more about it. That's why I'm very interested in, in those early episodes of the cast, especially. Uh, Clemente, in his program, he was one of the investigators. He, he, he was involved in investigating Webb Hubble um, yep. and the Rose Law Firm, and he really feels that crimes were committed. And that justice was not done, and that, and all of this. So, they, they, you know, that there might be a little more meat to to it than uh, what other uh, what other people, you know, put to Clinton. But how is it doing this transition from Nixon to Clinton? I mean, first reaction of many people will be, "Oh my God, you know, Nixon was really uh, the worst, and and everything like that." But I guess, uh, I guess, I just take it from there. How is it? How is it doing that transition? Uh, it's very different. It's a very different mm. project. With the first season, we found as we were researching and writing it that there were a lot of parallels to be sort of drawn between what happened during those two years and two months and what was what's been happening in our country now. Um, just just in terms of pure like subplots, you know, there there was a fight over uh, whether the president would you know uh, allow himself to be interviewed, you know, stuff like that. Um, mm. There was just a lot of little moments that that people could could listen could listen to the show and, and notice and say, oh wait, that's that's pretty similar to what's been happening now. You know, one good example was when Nixon released a bunch of transcripts of the White House tapes. Uh, you know, it, it was quickly discovered that he they had edited edited them very uh, aggressively and, and and in a way that obviously favored the president. And when someone on the House Judiciary Committee leaked those discrepancies to the press. Uh, one of Nixon's guys, Pat Buchanan, came out and said, you know, we, we should really be investigating. We should really be having these newspaper reporters write about is who is doing this leaking. You know, the leaking is the real crime here. It was mm-hmm. just like very similar to the kind of thing, you you know, we were hearing more, you know, a lot of in the early days of the Trump administration. So anyway, so that, that was definitely like a subtext that ran through the first season. We didn't we didn't like hit hit people over the head with it on purpose. Um but 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 with this season, I think the parallels are there, but they're limited and they're pretty general, whereas with the first season, they were pretty specific. You know, I think you could argue that under Clinton, you had, um, you know, you had a, a, a special counsel, a special prosecutor making accusations that, you know, Clinton supporters didn't really seem to care that much about, you know, after this, after this, after and while Star was sort of putting together the Star Report, you know, the public kind of took Clinton's side. And I think it was really frustrating and confusing to Starr and, and other people who, who worked on that team. Like, why don't people care more about this? Like, why don't, why aren't they taking this more seriously? And I think you see some of that now where, you know, you, you, you look at, you know, Trump's, uh, approval ratings among Republicans and you're like, I can't believe they don't care, you know, about all these, about all these seemingly, um, valid accusations that are being made. So that, that's one, that's one kind of parallel. But I think the, I think that what's going to take the place of that sort of like, I spy uh, a historical echo uh, game uh, mm-hmm. in this season is that people are going to people are going to think about how different uh, the world was 20, just a mere 20 years ago. You know, 20 years, not that long. Um, but I think it's going to be really startling to hear how different uh, the media environment was, how different people's sort of um, intuitions about sex and power were. And I think people are going to be moved to sort of imagine how they would have reacted if, if all these events are taking place now. And like, depending on how old people are, they will wonder they will wonder what what they would have thought if they'd been, you know, around and, 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 and sort of plugged in and engaged in the news then. Or if they were around then and engaged in the news, they will try to remember what their reactions were and wonder, um, you know, what they got wrong or what they missed. It's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And you even have the game theory of 
the fact that there had been Watergate and that there had been Whitewater and the Clinton impeachment. And I see that in President Trump's actions, for instance, uh, in not wanting to be interviewed because it's a perjury trap. And you have the supporters saying it's a perjury trap. Now, these people, if they were in a time machine, would not likely be supporters of Bill Clinton's or or his attempt to get out of testifying during that case. But um, now they see how it worked out for him and they don't want to see Trump do that because they have that play now. In in the Clinton uh, impeachment, I think it was a, a very similar that maybe House Republicans, having had the House for the first time since the 50s, wanted to do to Clinton what uh, what had been done to Nixon and sort of executing that play. And it didn't work out as well as they planned, although it did hurt Clinton's image. But to the point, I think it's this kind of time travel and attitudes is going to be really interesting for this new show because... Uh, there's so many things you have the the one of your episodes I liked in the first season was about true believers where you talked about how people supported Nixon no matter what came out and there's the bar in Queens and there's Shelter Island Long Island where you know the, the Nixon got his greatest plurality in the country and they they were kicking people out if they said anything bad about Nixon and the Archie Bunker types and all of that and for people on the left. I think a a way to look at it might be, okay, you can make fun of those people or you can look at those people as other or whatever, but maybe point the camera on yourself as well. Uh, Are you doing that or or are we supporting our leaders too much as well? Yeah, I think I think I think um, I think one big question that that we had um, and that hopefully we, you know, listeners will um, will be moved to, to think about as they listen to the show is. You know, how much of this was just tribal? Like, were, 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 did people really believe the things they were saying, the positions, and did they believe in the positions they were taking? Or, were, you know, were, were, were the Republicans who were, uh, you know, denouncing Clinton for lying, on, you know, in a, in, in a civil deposition or, or, or lying to his wife about, about his uh, affair, you know, were they just sort of being political opportunists? And were the Democrats who sided with Clinton, were they simply doing that out of expedience or, or, or sort of a tactical, uh, you know, strategic um, reasoning? Or did they really think that he, you know, didn't didn't commit an impeachable offense? I think I think trying to sort of puzzle out people's motives and mm-hmm. um, trying to sort of uh, trying to sort of uh, assess their people's sincerity is something that we're interested in, because um, I do think that reflects on us. And I do think um, we could all you know, be, be better about, um, sort of checking our, our, our instincts and wonder and asking ourselves whether we are kind of just following the people we, uh, we identify with and, um, and not thinking, you know, uh, about certain issues like on their merits. And unlike the Nixon situation, Clinton enjoyed, as you reference, enormous popular support, turns around a second term, midterm in 1998, House gains seats in the House, really never happened for a second term, midterm, just gains in popularity. But I remember the conflict at the time when you actually asked people individually, do you really like what was done in the Oval Office? And I I would say I didn't. I, As someone who follows the presidency and respects the the office and it didn't seem very proper nor you know i knew he was also being persecuted to an extent and all of that that's that's me and that's people back in 98 or so now you have this additional change in that you have the me too movement yep and i i wonder how much of that is going to go into your analysis yeah so so um i i, I definitely think you're right that people could hold both views at once they could say I don't think that he committed an impeachable offense, and I think the Republicans are going after him on, you know, on opportunistic grounds. Um, but I also am disgusted by what he did. I don't, uh, I don't think that adultery is 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 you know ethical, and I don't think the president should be engaged in it, and I don't think the president should lie to the country. I think people could hold all those opinions in their head at one time. Um, I think, um, nevertheless, like the the seven months that passed between when the story broke in January of 98 to when, uh, you know, star, uh, I believe it was seven months when star submitted the impeachment referral. Um, you know, people, people kind of got used to it. I think is one thing that happened. I think the shock wore off. And I do think, you know, those first couple, you know, those first couple of weeks 
uh, they had no idea what was going to happen. The Clinton White House. They thought they were worried. They were, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know whether they were going to keep public support. Um, after um, Clinton admitted, you know, in, in front of uh, the grand jury uh, and then also in front of the nation on, on, in, a, in a televised address that he had, in fact, misled the nation. Um, I don't think anyone knew what, what was going to happen. I think there was a lot of fear that Democrats were going to uh, were going to abandon him. And I think there was a real risk of that happening. Um, I think if, th- if things hadn't broken and, uh, you know, if things could, things could have broken a different way, but I do think those seven months, you know, kind of softened the blow. And I think they, they, um, they made it so that people turned their ire on Ken Starr because Ken Starr was the one who seemed unreasonable. And Ken Starr seemed looked like the one who was hunting Clinton and being, you know, and obsessing over the sexual, you know, these sexual details. And I think when the Star Report came out and was full of all the sexual detail, that was truly shocking. Um, and it's still shocking when you read it that, that this was like an official government document. I think that really turned people off. Um, and so I think I think I think it really helped Clinton. But I but I but I but I think um, to your question about me, too, um, well, I think one of the reasons it's going to be interesting for people to imagine this happening now is that is that the intuitions we bring to the news uh you know, or at least, you know, obviously you can't generalize, but in, in my milieu and in, in, in the media, I think, uh, attitudes, uh, are, are, are a hundred percent changed. I don't think anyone would tolerate, uh, or, or, or move to defend a president who, who engaged in an affair with a, with an intern. Um, just because like, it's a, it's almost like a parody of a, of a, of a, of a power imbalance. It's the president of the United States and an, and an unpaid intern. You know what I mean? Like, Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's it was it was consensual, you know. It was it was one hundred percent consensual, and she was an adult, and so that makes it harder. It's not. I was going to say, yeah, you know, I think I think I, think I was starting to say it's the ultimate Me Too story, which is not true because there was no there was no coercion here, at least uh, in an active sense. Like I think one could argue that it was inherently coercive, and I think a lot of people would argue that now. Um, but I, I do think it it you know it, it was it was the, the whole thing was complicated by the fact that. Um, this was an adult. This was a twenty, a twenty, a, year, a very young adult who's twenty three years old who did not want the label of victim. You know, she and she for for many years rejected the label of, of victim. And I think it still does. But I think in a in a recent essay she in Vanity Fair she talks about how you know the Me Too movement has sort of caused her to think more about her experience through the prism of power dynamics. So I, I suspect her her feelings on it have evolved. But um, but it just goes to show you that it's um that it wasn't just like people were unenlightened which i think i think i think there was some of that certainly and i think i think people's people's just people just weren't trained to think about power imbalance in the way we are now i heard a lot of uh democratic let's say liberal minded women say the guy's a creep yeah but i yeah. I'm, I'm i'm gonna tell the pollster you know I'm, I'm i want him to continue family leave policies and the, everything else yeah but then you know there's like a pretty infamous like uh there's a pretty infamous roundtable that the New York Observer uh, hosted mm-hmm. that we'll get into in the show, you know, involving a bunch of uh, sort of high profile uh, women, including women who had, you know, who had written about sex, talking about Clinton after the story broke. And, there, you know, the vibe of that roundtable was like, ah, oh, gosh, what a charming rogue. You know, yeah, kind of a creep, but but I almost makes it almost makes me like him more. You know, that was sort of the vibe of it. I, but but again, it's hard to generalize. Obviously, there 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 was a, 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 a variety of opinions. And our and our ambition with this with this season is basically to uh, to try to figure out where everybody was coming from. You know, like where were the Democrats coming from? Where were the Republicans coming from? Where was Ken Starr coming from? Where was Clinton mm-hmm. and Lewinsky coming? You know, it's, we're trying to understand why people reacted to all this the way they did and why they made the, they, they made the decisions they did. And I think that's I think that will that will provide our listeners with fodder upon which uh, with which to sort of make uh, moral. Uh, assessments of different people mm. and different decisions but we sort of are are, are pretty res- resolute in kind of leaving that to uh to the listeners and just presenting the story from as many perspectives as we can and trying to do everything we can to show what everyone was thinking if that makes sense that's the way to do it no doubt well uh everyone who's listening to my podcast i will admonish you to get your perspective by listening to leon's that podcast is slow burn it is in its second season Uh, which is going to delve into the Clinton impeachment and all the related investigations. Leon, thanks so much. Hey, Bruce, thanks so much. I really enjoyed this. Remember, Slow Burn Podcast Season 2 is now live. So go check it out on iTunes, CastBox, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, If you like this show, you're going to like 
going to like to hear about that.